This session is on Belgium's right to die for children, uh, and to what extent it's a slippery slope. So we're going to look at that specific right to die in Belgium in a kind of wider European context and ask ethical questions of it and what we can learn from it and what do we think about it. My name's Tiffany Jenkins, I'm the chair. Speaking first will be Professor Honor O'Neill, who's the chair of the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission and is a cross-bench member of the House of Lords. We'll then hear from Professor Raphael cohen Almoga, who's a chair in politics at the University of Hull. We'll then hear from Professor Jute van der Werf ten Bosch, who's head of paediatric homo-oncology at UZ Brussels, and then Dr. Kevin Newhall on my immediate left who produced this session, who's a senior lecturer in history at the University of Sunderland, and he's the author of Assisted Suicide, The Liberal Humanist Case Against Liberalization. Honora, would you like to begin and we'll start? Well, I'll begin, and first, I, in this context, we could all tell stories about distressing deaths we have known, and I'm not going to add to them, and I don't think it helps to tell those stories. What I am going to do is to set out the legal context in which assistance in bringing about someone's death is now being discussed in this country. Because I think that will give us an anchor point for talking about what is how what's currently proposed here differs from the voluntary euthanasia law in Belgium, which is our theme today. I think the fundamental difference is that what we're discussing here is an amendment to the law on suicide rather than legalization of euthanasia. Let me therefore start out with what is the law on suicide in the UK? In the UK, committing suicide is lawful and it always has been lawful. You can see why, because when someone succeeds, there's nobody to prosecute. It used to be unlawful to attempt but then fail to commit suicide. That law was repealed in 1961, so a while ago. What remains unlawful is aiding or betting another person's suicide. Now that law has a very clear purpose. We want people to rescue and support others who are teetering on the brink of suicide, not to encourage them or egg them on or push them. The present so-called assisted dying bill aims to make quite a narrow exception to the legal prohibition on aiding and abetting another person's suicide. Its proper title ought to be the assisting suicide bill, and I imagine there will be an, an attempt to uh, change the title uh, at the next stage in Parliament. This UK bill is modelled on the approach taken in Oregon, not on legislation enacted in the Netherlands or in Belgium. It permits a doctor to assist someone to commit suicide if they are adult, fully competent, suffering from a terminal illness, not depressed, not unduly influenced. Each of these criteria is pretty difficult to capture in the clear and robust form that legislation requires. And the bill's about to reach second reading and we'll have amendments. The fundamental way in which the UK bill resembles Oregon laws is that it tries to make assistance by doctors lawful if all the conditions are met. This is quite problematic because many doctors see assisting another person's suicide as incompatible with their professional duty. That's true in Oregon too, where people have to shop around for willing doctors. Interestingly, there's now a lot of discussion here of whether a better process would be subject to judicial rather than medical oversight, and the bill might get changed in that way. Now, in the course of debating this bill and a previous <coughs> bill introduced by Lord Joffe a few years ago, which failed, I realized that a number of aspects of the current law are very widely misunderstood. First of all, some people believe that a doctor may not give pain relief if that might shorten a life. That's not true for two reasons. First, painkillers rarely shorten lives. There's robust evidence on that. The reasons for limiting access to opiate, opiate or drugs have much more to do with the risk of their misuse by others, for example, their, them being stolen and sold on the market. And I believe time would be better spent ensuring good access to skilled pain reliefs than on some of aspects of the current bill. That would really assist the dying, and by the way, not only the dying. Secondly, in the UK, it is and always has been permissible to provide treatment that's intended to relieve suffering, even if it might shorten life. 
It's lawful, for example, to do a risky operation, provided the aim is to help the, uh, the patient, not to kill them. In the event the patient dies, the doctor has done nothing unlawful. This isn't, by the way, new. It's the so-called doctrine of double effect, developed by St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, fundamental in medical ethics still. Unfortunately, it's widely but falsely believed that doctors may not give treatment that shortens lives. Third, the bill is wholly irrelevant for most people who die in distressing circumstances. It's focused solely on adults who are terminally ill, have full cognitive competence, and a settled intention to commit suicide. Most people who would qualify under those criteria could act for themselves, and the bill's intended for the relatively small number who can't. It's irrelevant to people with dementia or other cognitive impairment, to those with fluctuating intentions or depression, to those with chronic but not terminal illness. Now, it's worth knowing what happens now if death's assisted. At present, assisting someone else's death is unlawful. So, in principle, there can be prosecution. Usually, there isn't. We know that because the Director of Public Prosecutions published a policy for prosecutors in respect of cases of encouraging or assisted suicide in 2010, which sets out relevant factors for deciding whether prosecution is in the public interest. So the result is there are very few prosecutions, but nobody gets an advance guarantee of immunity from prosecution. It's sometimes said it's wrong to investigate let alone prosecute those who have acted entirely out of compassion in dreadful circumstances. I don't think that's convincing. We're all protected by the fact that there will be an investigation of any death brought about by another person. Nor do I expect that if the current bill becomes law, it will offer an advance guarantee that there will be no investigation of those who assist with something as serious as another's death. It won't be enough to have the right paperwork ahead of time. I would expect that if it became lawful, prosecution for assisted suicide would still be possible and would still remain very rare. What's happening? The bill's going through the House of Lords committee days on the 18th of October, very soon. Exceptionally, this is a private member's bill, but it's getting a lot of time. At the moment, both proponents and opponents see it as incomplete. So I expect a lot of amendments will be tabled with the aims of working out in which ways it's robust, or how it could be made more robust. Thank you. Thank you. Rafa. I want to open with a small confession. When I started my own journey about aid in dying and, uh, and euthanasia and physician assisted suicide, I did support euthanasia. I thought that, ethically speaking, I can imagine cases in which a patient suffers enormously um, he, she wants to die because um, she lost meaning in life. Life is no longer appealing to her and, uh, and she's suffering. Great deal of suffering. And she's afraid to commit suicide because she's afraid to uh, open her eyes to even more horrible situation because she's not really qualified. She's not a medical doctor oftentimes. And she's horrified by the prospect of waking up to even more miserable life. And therefore, she asks assistance. She asks assistance from a physician who is qualified to provide such assistance. So I thought at, for, for a number of years uh, that euthanasia is the right thing to do. Um, and then I changed my mind. I changed my mind after eight, things, eight years of thinking about these issues, not because philosophically, ethically speaking, I was changing my mind. But I believe that there is uh, a fine line that separates between philosophy and policy. Philosophy in the realm there, you know, somewhere in the clouds, we all can philosophize about certain things. But there's also practical reality we have to uh, reckon with. And when I was challenged with reality, I said, well, I don't want to give my endorsement to do something that I feel doesn't work or doesn't work properly. So I changed my, my mind after eight years of thinking about these issues because in 1999 I was invited to the Netherlands and from the first go, from the first day of, of my meetings with what I call the cream de la cream of the euthanasia policy and practice, those that actually uh, were behind the motions and practicing euthanasia, I understood that there are severe problems. 
I understood there's a lot of abuse. I understood that uh, people are dying prematurely and sometimes they die unnecessarily, uh, simply because the control mechanism are in with the hands of, of doctor physicians. Now, this is about, Belg about the Netherlands. Belgium came later. But Belgium is very, very curious because we still don't know for how long euthanasia has been practiced in Belgium. It was all done in a very, I would say, confidential manner. In the Netherlands, we have evidence, we have literature showing euthanasia has been practiced since the late 60s. There's no such evidence when we come to, the, to Belgium. And within six months after the Dutch legislation, which happened in 2002, suddenly we found legislation, similar legislation in Belgium. And we don't have the history behind this. And we don't have the long pondering, the long process of public debate about these issues. It all was done very, very quickly, very swiftly. And when we are talking about life and death, I think that's the last thing you should do. You should be far more careful about what you are doing. And it seems to me there's something that is intoxicating about euthanasia because it pushes the envelope more and more as we progress with time. As I said, the legislation process ended in 2002, but since then we've seen enormous amount of, of initiatives and discussions to enlarge the law. And I want to highlight some of the issues that Belgium has been grappling with and introduced in the past decade. So they decided that they are going to euthanize people who are, in their language, tired of life. And there was the incidence of Nathan Verholst in last year, in 2013, because he was suffering unbearable psychological suffering following a board sex change operation. He was 44 years old. And he, the result of the sex separation was not appealing to him, and he asked to be euthanized, and he was granted this by a physician. On my part, I think that such patients should be treated with care and psychiatric treatment, right, trying to alleviate the, the depression, and not to take care of them by euthanasia. Another major concern relates to the number of people who are killed without the expressed request. Now, the law in Belgium is very, very clear. It says that it has to be the consent of a competent patient. But here we feel, we see that many, many patients are killed, euthanized, without any consent. And when physicians were asked, why is that happening? They explained the decision was not discussed because the patient was comatose in 70% of the cases, had dementia in 21% of the cases, or because discussion would have been harmful to the patient's best interest. But I say the law says very explicitly the patient is an adult or emancipated minor, and asked what does it mean, emancipated minor, and I was told that it's someone below the threshold of 18 that has the capacity to understand what's going on. It doesn't speak about demented patients, it doesn't speak about comatose patients, so this is a violation of the law. Now, if you think that there is a violation of, your law, of the law, you need to address this and you need to redeem this. But when I asked Belgian colleagues, very esteemed Belgian colleagues, not only did they not try to address it, they tried to condone this. They tried to explain this to me. You cannot explain something that is unexplainable. It's illegal. So you should fight against this. You should not authorize this or should, should try to legitimize this in any other way. I find it staggering. And then now there's a new motion that wants to take into account what is already happening to legalize euthanasia of patients with dementia, which for me is an extremely problematic issue because it's no longer addressing the issue of competency. So you can kill anyone who is not competent. And I think it goes to the heart of what we believe if we are granting euthanasia to, to patients. It goes to the heart of the autonomy principle individuality principle, rationality principle, all these are gone with the wind when you're speaking about dementia, and still they authorize this. Another warning ph phenomena is terminal sedation, meaning that you have patients in the hospitals that will never wake up, and they're not going to wake up, and they're not told that they're not going to wake up. It's not euthanasia, because there's no consent there. 
They, someone decides in the medical team that their life are not worth living, and they slowly sit, sedate them with morphine and other sedatives until they put them to sleep eternally. Now, there's not much literature about this. We don't know the numbers exactly what's going on, but we do know that the numbers are going up all the time. And again, no consent needed in such a procedure, which I find it's horrifying. We know that there are problems in the monitoring system. We know there's a lack of notification of the euthanasia cases. We also know the Belgian established a control committee to study all issues of euthanasia. And this committee is supposed to receive all reports of euthanasia, study them, scrutinize them. And if there's a need, they're going to penalize the physicians who did illegal acts. Now, surprise, surprise. The president of this esteemed commission is the number one proponent of euthanasia in the country, which couldn't be, for, for me, a clear conflict of interest, that a person who euthanizes more patients probably than anyone else is the judge of euthanasia cases in the country. Now, I think that this is clear to anybody outside of Belgium, but nobody in Belgium actually tells him, uh, sorry, Mr. Distelmans, but there is a clear conflict of interest here you have to choose. Either you want to practice euthanasia or you want to scrutinize euthanasia. But with all due respect, you cannot do both. And nobody says this in Belgium, or hardly anybody says this in Belgium. And he's been doing this for a number of years. We know that, that physicians in Belgium are complaining about the changing role that they have in Belgium. Meaning from healing, now they're in the profession of killing. And there are problems with that. These are not addressed properly, according to physicians. We know that sometimes nurses are asked to perform euthanasia when they should not in violation of the law. We know that there is a confusion within physicians about the act of euthanasia. This is why terminal sedation is allowed. We know there's an inadequate consultation with independent consultants. Again, it's a problem that is lingering on since 2002, not being addressed properly. We know that there are organ transplantation of euthanized patients. And again, clear, clear, cannot be clear conflict of interest if you are killing patients for their organs or that you have that kind of intention in your mind. And we know that there is a problem of newborns that are getting killed. So last year, the Belgian decided to euthanize also children. Now what's going on? What happened to all the logic, all the phraseology, all the reasoning in 2002 just went out of, the, out of the sky. What happened to that? Because in 2002, they did differentiate between adults and non-adults. And they had good reason to differentiate between them. Now, if you can euthanize yourself, you ask, you are seven years old, and said, I want to die. Well, why don't you have sex at the age of seven? Get married at the age of eight. Have mortgage at the age of, of nine. Go and kill yourself in the battlefield at the age of 10. I mean, what's the difference? If there's no meaning to adulthood anymore, where do you stand? I found it very problematic. Thank you very much. I would really like to comment on this title of this talk, uh, first of all, because in, in my opinion, uh, the word right to die is not well chosen in this context. I presume the word refers to the recent Belgian bill, which allows terminally ill children, especially, to request euthanasia in certain circumstances. So I would like to stress the word request, because it's the right to request euthanasia. In this situation, their illness and the imminent death is just fate. It's not a right that they fought for, they're just dying. But taking into account that death will be coming anyway, I think we can agree on the fact that the actual act of dying can, in some cases, be orchestrated according to the patient's very personal wishes, taking into account their religion, their beliefs, their longings, and their fears. Some people estimate the mere fact of life, defined by a beating heart and blood that is flowing regardless of the mental state, for example unconsciousness, or the amount of pain or discomfort, as the highest good which should be protected in all circumstances till nature takes its course. However, there are many people like myself, like my children, who find their lives only meaningful given certain circumstances. 
These circumstances will differ from one person to another. There's no need to judge here. Both opinions are valuable and every individual should have the right to live up to them. We can assume that in each country, in every communi community, people of both sorts are present. But too often society doesn't allow the latter group to discuss their thoughts openly. People who express the wish to die, even if they suffer, and by suffering I don't mean pain only, but also fear, or for example shortness of breath, motorical disabilities, or severe, severe psychological suffering, are often judged, judged by those from the first group, leading to shame, isolation, and even more suffering. Moreover, thoughts on wanting to die are not specific for a person who is over 18. Some, maybe even many children, especially those with chronic illnesses, think about this too and will be equally hurt by a society that doesn't allow them to discuss their thoughts openly and without judgment. The laws that have been implemented in Belgium, that is the law on patients' rights, the law on palliative care, and both laws on euthanasia in adults as well as children, have helped to create a society in which those people who feel the need to do so are invited to discuss death with their caretakers in an open and respectful environment. Very often, a request for euthanasia is made, but the act is never performed. As the knowledge that one doesn't have to go, has, that one doesn't have to go on often gives the courage to continue life and enjoy some more moments with loved ones supported by a team that is also well-trained in all the other aspects of end-of-life care, which are equally important. However, if patients do feel the need to proceed, there are possibility to honor this request and to help patients orchestrate their death according to their wishes. I would also like to th say something about the word slippery slope. I've been a pediatric oncologist for over 15 years now, and I've worked on a slippery slope all that time. Patients suffer, patients come to ask for help, and we try to help them as good as we can, knowing that we might be prosecuted, and then maybe no sanctions might follow, but we're never sure, we're never sure. So I would really plead in favor of a bill or a law that makes it clear for us, for physicians, who are really actually dealing with these patients that are dying, I am on the bedside of that child that is dying, and I am responsible for how it's going to, to happen, that we can, can, can perform our profession in this field as, as well guided by the law as we can. The law guarantees in Belgium well describes limits to work within and thus allow us uh, the doctors who are willing, and so that's also very important, to help patients who are asking. Nobody is obliged. In comparison, the introduction of a law on abortion didn't lead to abortions being performed in every pregnant woman. Neither were physicians forced to perform abortion if this was against their philosophy. Moreover, dying is against the human nature. Not many people want to die, and most doctors prefer by far to help their patients in any other way possible than to help them die. This means that usually other possibilities are proposed, discussed and tested, tested by the patients, the caretakers and the euthanasia committee before everyone involved agrees that euthanasia is the least bad solution within the circumstances given. Thank you. Thank you. In 1939, the Euthanasia Society of America urged a law on the termination of life on the basis of suffering. Charles Nixdorf, the, the society's treasurer, acknowledged the measure was limited to voluntary euthanasia because the public couldn't accept incorporating children and, as it was called at the time, incompetence. However, at the article noted that society hoped eventually to legalize uh, the putting to death of non-volunteers beyond the help of medical science. And it immediately struck me that there were similarities uh, with Belgium. Um, that uh, had been proposed in the United States. And in some way, Belgium, um, which is, of course, as we've heard, legalized uh, euthanasia for children and is, is on the process of legalizing it for those with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, is doing exactly that. But of course, being a historian, I think it's very, very useful to look at what's similar, but much more important to look at what's very different. And I think the drive uh, behind the whole discussion is entirely different. So what can we learn from Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, I would say the most important 
well, perhaps not the most important point, but it's certainly an, an important point, is that despite this, the, the sort of uh, assurances of safeguards, so for instance, in the Faulkner Bill, it's, it's uh, currently going through, there's a big emphasis on safeguards. Um, most of the agenda lurks below the surface, I think, both in this country and uh, as certainly, as we can see, in Belgium and Holland. I think now that it's fairly incontrovertible now that, that Belgium has granted the, the uh, we can call it right to die if you like, uh, or something else, but certainly he's, he's elected um, to have euthanasia, uh, psychotic murderer Frank van der Bleeken, uh, that allowing euthanasia or assisted suicide for some creates an increased demand. And I would point to this sort of moral beachhead that's established once you have the principle of um, euthanasia or voluntary death, more accurately, uh, inside a country. Once, once this moral beachhead is established, activists seek more territory. Uh, and this is always denied by people who are saying, for instance, um, that uh, you know, we should look to Oregon, which is, of course, as, as uh, Professor O'Neill has been saying, is the, the basis to the legislation in this country. And uh, they say in Oregon, things have proceeded relatively smoothly. Uh, but it's much better to examine entire countries where there's a culture that accepts voluntary death. And I think this is very evident looking at, at uh, the, the low countries. Um, it's, those campaigning for euthanasia and assisted suicide don't simply go home once it's been achieved. Uh, so for instance, if you look at the NVVE in the Netherlands or ADMD in Belgium, they continue to campaign and as Raphael's pointed out, uh, have, are very close to the levers of power. Um, in these countries, and uh, still you have a, an active campaign to, to uh, spread the benefits of, of euthanasia further and further. I suppose what is most disturbing is not so much the actual numbers, because I think almost everybody agrees that the numbers of people either taking up this option, particularly children in, in, uh, in Belgium, um, the numbers of people taking up the option are pretty small um, particularly in Oregon, you could talk about. So it's not so much the numbers that I find disturbing, but the lack of any sort of discussion, particularly in the Belgian case. Um, if, as, as Dr. Stefan van Gould noted, if one opens the door, you have no more control of what is going through the door. It's like the discussion has had, we accept the process of voluntary death. Now it's going to be extended further and further. And what struck me about Belgium is that there is very little discussion, you know, the health minister didn't even turn up to the debate uh, when, it, when euthanasia was extended to children. And because they've accepted that principle of voluntary death, um, then it's, it's sort of rolled out uh, to everybody. And I don't think we'll see the last of it, um, the, uh, the sort of right to die, if you like. And of course, there's, you know, there's a, 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 I don't like the term slippery slope. I think it's much more a, a Rubicon. Once you pass that Rubicon, then then you're going to go on. But it's very difficult to say um, if to, to draw a moral line between allowing, for instance, an 86-year-old dying of cancer to uh, have compassion of, of an assisted death um, or a 26-year-old lovelorn person. I mean, how can you deny the 26-year-old person if you're going to do it on the basis of compassion and um, autonomy? It's, it's exactly the same principle, and I think that's what we, we would mean by slippery slope. So the second point I want to make is, is, is about the difference between um, America in the 30s and, and what's happening now. I think that the underlying driver is completely different. I think in the 1930s you had a, a motivation to take a stronger society, a, a rather misguided one, uh, but at least it was meant to control things. Euthanasia was going to provide a better, create a better humanity and that this was the whole basis of, of, of grasping this. And instead, today, it's, a, it's, it's almost, uh, almost the opposite. I, I think it's, it's a moral abdication. I, I, that's the only phrase I can actually think of that, that fits. I mean, as Eugene Kontorovich in, noted in the Washington Post, um, he was talking about a case called Roper versus Simmons, which uh, banned the death penalty, we ruled it was inherently death, unconstitutional to apply the death penalty to under, anybody under the age of 18. He made the point that this is a system which permits the euthanasia of innocent 12-year-olds but not the punishment of guilty 17-year-olds is one that exalts autonomy without co culpability. And I think this is really uh, what's, uh, under, what's happening here. The motivation appears to, to be a flight from moral responsibility. 
And this is shown in the increase of cases um, in, in Netherlands and Belgium. And of course, uh, cases of euthanasia have gone up in the last year in, in the Netherlands, 15%. Uh, but interestingly, assisted suicide, which is allowed under, under the Dutch law, has only represents about 7 to 8% of the cases of hastened death and only 2% in the Netherlands. And as the Lancet observed, although euthanasia rights have, have risen substantially in past years, assisted suicide remains a rare choice for Belgian and Dutch patients. Uh, why? Because patients uh, shy away from suicide because the act involves them taking responsibility for an act. And you can see for, for the suicide, you can see this with the whole assisted dying. Don't call it suicide. We want to medicalize it and diffuse any sort of moral responsibility for the action as much as possible. And I think this is a, a fascinating aspect of the whole uh, what's happening in Belgium and Holland and something we can learn from. It's worth looking at the etymology of the debate and examining the way, uh, the way we're actually referring to it. And I think the, we go to, from euthanasia, which of course involves somebody else doing it, to assisted dying, which means just about nobody does it, uh, to uh, suicide, which is what really, uh, you know, I think is at the heart of the matter. So Belgium shows that just that it's not really about suffering or pains, uh, it's not about uh, autonomy or rights or anything else like that. The driver for legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide is a growing helplessness, fear, uncertainty, and flight from uh, responsibility. And I think when we're thinking about children um, in Belgium, it's, it's, it's a deferring of the moral decisions to others. And it's this, you know, take some responsibility for this. So why else would we give a, a hugely important decision, one that I, as a 50-year-old adult, would find very, very difficult to make. Uh, why would I be giving this to an 8-year-old child or a 7-year-old child or a 12-year-old child, a child uh, who, as Raphael said, can't choose to have sex or buy a house or even watch the television programs that they want? And yet we are, we are you know, having this conversation with people uh, this, of this age to actually um, what they want to do. But it's made even more clear by Frank van den Blieken um, why you would have a, a psychotic prisoner single-handedly bring back the death penalty in Belgium um, with, just on their request. The prisoner is psychotic. Uh, the prisoner is a prisoner. The prisoner has been convicted and, um, and suddenly we're asking this person for some sort of moral guidance about whether they uh, should live or die. They have been sentenced to that sentence and I would say they should serve that sentence. And, uh, it's very difficult to disagree with De Zijt. Uh, their assessment said after Belgium legalized euthanasia for children that Belgium is a failed state. Uh, the whole legalization of, of voluntary death seems to be this expression of evading responsibility, of, of moral abdication. I think this is something that Belgium uh, shows very clearly, and I think it shows how different it, it is than it was in the 1930s. Okay, thank you to our panel. Nora, can I come to you first? First, I just wonder what you think about what's happening in the Benelux countries. I do think that euthanasia is a different proposition from assisting people in committing suicide. It's a question of where the decision lies and the conditions you have to meet. meet. Uh, so uh, I actually don't think that there's a slippery slope that leads one from uh, assisted uh, suicide as envisaged here should this legislation become law, uh, this bill become law, towards uh, the Belgian situation. And that's not merely because of the different situation, a different way we would look at children. Perhaps we're more paternalistic. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure that that would not go through Parliament here in, in, under any circumstances. I think that uh, what um, one really has to, to take one's mind to is the avoidance of suffering. And what the legislation currently in place provides, and I find it interesting that a lot of people talk about assisted dying, meaning assistance with suicide, who haven't even executed an advanced directive, haven't even worked out what treatment, life-prolonging treatment, they do, re would refuse. That is an option that is open to everyone. And I think I would take that as the earnest, so to speak, of uh, not wishing to live further, that you have worked out what you're not going to accept 
Any one of us can say, I'm not going to accept prolonged artificial ventilation, for example. And it would then be wrong for any physician to inflict prolonged artificial ventilation. If people aren't willing to make that step, I don't see that they have a settled intention to die. But what about this concern? I think Raphael said there's an intoxication in the nature of granting some type of suicide, some type of euthanasia that has an expansionary quality now. So it may begin here, but it ends up here. How do you stop well, that well, from okay. happening here? I mean, Look, slippery slope. Once the moral, yes. once the moral uh, line's uh, gone. Uh, slippery slope is a metaphor we use with the thought that you permit something and then somebody goes a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. Good legislation take, puts some grit on slippery slopes. Good legislation sets out clear criteria. And by the way, one of the things there is that it deals with the conflict of interest problem. And I'm sure there will be discussion about this at committee stage. The difficulty of putting all the burden on doctors is that it does put them in the conflict of interest situation. They are responsible for the well-being of the patient, and suddenly they're, uh, they're being asked to take responsibility for ending the patient's life. I understand why most doctors in this country, as in Oregon, are not willing to be put in a conflict situation. They might look at it differently if there were a judicial process, but nobody's worked that out. That's what we use, for example, for brain death cases, where it is permissible to switch off the ventilator. But we don't uh, do that without a judicial process. Raphael, really it's just a question of good legislation, and that's what you didn't have. In Belgium. Well, I, I want to, to make uh, three important comments. Uh, Kevin. Uh, rightly mentioned the fact that very few Belgians are opting uh, for physician-assisted suicide. The, the difference between the two, just to make clear that we're all on the same page, in, in euthanasia, the physician administers lethal injection into the vein of the patient and kills the patient. With physician-assisted suicide, the physician prescribes lethal medication and put it in a pudding, and the last act is performed by the patient. That's the difference between the two. So it has to do with the control mechanism on who is making the last act. So Kevin uh, highlighted the fact, the true fact, that there are very few uh, cases of physician assisted suicide in both Netherlands and, and Belgium. Now, why is that? Think about the following. Suppose you, you are in a school, and uh, you are a student, you're enrolled in the school, and uh, the, the teacher for physical uh, exercise offers you two options. You can either play rugby or you play cricket. Surprise, surprise, you'll find very few people who are going to play football in that school. That's what happens in Belgium. The physician don't propose uh, on the menu of options, they don't propose the issue of physician assisted suicide. And because most of the people are not aware of the difference between the two, and because the issue has not been debated sufficiently in Belgium, then that's the case. We find many cases of euthanasia. Whereas if you want really to have some sort of monitoring and control mechanisms and be sure that the patient is receiving what he or she wants, then you should insist on physician assisted suicide rather than euthanasia. But all this discussion has been silenced, or mostly silenced, in Belgium. We don't find these voices there. Secondly is the issue of voluntariness of, of, of the patient. Just imagine that in Belgium and also in Netherlands, the system is very much similar to, to Great Britain in that, that there is a GP that is the point of reference. For every problem, you go to the GP. And in Belgium Netherlands, often the GP comes to your home if you cannot go to the clinic. What effect does it have on you as a patient when suddenly your GP, whom you trusted for 30 years, is proposing to you euthanasia? And when I ask this question about voluntariness and what happens to a patient when your GP, your loyal GP, that's what he offers to you, and I say he because oftentimes it's a man, what effect does it have on the patient? The majority of the Belgian experts with whom I discuss said this is a red herring. It's not a main issue. Well, I think it's a main issue if you're talking about consent and the voluntary option of the patient to choose. I think it's detrimental, as it's of vast importance. And the last issue that I want to highlight of importance by, by the way, Lord Faulkner has put it very, 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 very eloquently 
in his bill, in proposed bill, and that's the issue of palliative care. I did research in the past 20 years on these issues in about 30 hospital and research centers in, in about eight countries. And the majority of the patients and the majority of the doctors whom I met in eight countries, they told me that the vast majority of the patients cling on to life in the most dire circumstances. So the most, uh, most patients really want to live, they don't want to die. Given the option, you know, it's not a big glick, you know, we say in Yiddish. It's not uh, something that you really aspire to have death. So most of the people really want to live. So we're talking about a very small number of patients who want to die. Research showed, especially in Oregon and other places, that once the element of suffering has been alleviated, then actually those, many of those patients will continue clinging to life. And oftentimes, in Belgium, the problem is inadequate palliative care. Or well, the Belgium pride itself to have a very advanced palliative care option that it happens. But when you I do the research and you go to the hospitals and you speak with the doctors and those who are making decision makers, decision making, they tell me, why should I consult a palliative care okay. expert? Okay. So it's, I think it's a, a bit bizarre. Kevin, I'm, I'm interested in whether you're satisfied by Nora's kind of clarification that the law will be quite precise, there's no chance that it's going to be changed. So why are we, why are we worried, really? I, I did say only that good legislation doesn't leave slippery slopes in the middle of, of things. I'm not certain yet, because this bill is not through, whether mm -hmm. it will be amended in ways that will make it good legislation or reject it. it either could happen. Right. Well, first of all, I, I didn't actually come up with the term slippery slope. It's not my favorite one. I think it's a, a better metaphor is the open door, because I think the real problem is, is that once you admit the reasons for uh, voluntary death being legitimated as being autonomy and compassion, then you allow any death that's on the basis of autonomy and compassion right through. So it's, you leave the door, you, somebody's kicked the door open, and other groups are inevitably going to go through. That's my... Uh, slight, uh, Inevitably, better. any time or now or I think uh, as and when. I think there, you know, you can see various different cases, and and you can see what's happened in Belgium, where where it begins at a certain level, and then uh, other groups have gone through. So, for instance, Frank van den Bleeken, uh, the prisoner, has said he wants to be. He has been granted the right. I don't know whether it's going to happen or not. We'll have to see. But he's been granted the right to die. And um, you have immediately 15 more prisoners saying, I would like the right to die as well. That's the problem. Once you set that precedent, then um, you can have people coming through. And I don't think, you know, I've had many debates with people about the Falconer Bill, and, and uh, you know, they like to have metaphors of crampons being stopping from the slippery slope, etc. I don't think, I think once you, you have that, you cross that moral line, there's very little defense you can make to other people appealing on the basis of their own suffering and their own autonomy. Um, to go through that door as well. Do too. And then what do you think about, uh, clarify, come back on Kevin. How do you respond to him? Uh, to, uh, about uh, the psychiatric uh, prisoner patients, uh, what do I think about that? And there's the kind of idea that once yeah. you've crossed that moral line... Well, I, I seem to not made... I didn't make it clear that the law is about the patient being allowed to request euthanasia. It's about requesting it, okay? And then there's a, it's not, because I don't think that's very clear either, I feel a little bit accused um, by my colleague on the left side who makes me feel like I'm, well, Belgian doctors are out there to get patients and help them to die as many as possible per day. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that at all. It's about requesting, so the request has to come from the patient, and if the patient requests for euthanasia, we have to take it seriously, because they're allowed to request it, and we have to look into it. And then, of course, it's very difficult. It can, it's never easy. Not one file is easy. Huh? So the euthanasia committee, who reviews every case before the euthanasia is before, performed, not afterwards, but before as well, uh, they um, sometimes have a very hard job. And, and who would, who would be on the yeah. euthanasia committee? Well, those are... Um, <laughs> Those are doctors, those are, uh, so it's, it's of course when this month is the chair, but there are also general practitioners, there are uh, lawyers, so people who study the law, there's, I think, a priest in there, 
And so people from who've, who've studied philosophy and everything, and the pediatrician very soon. Um, so they, uh, they evaluate a case, and then there is sometimes a lot of discussion, but not just one evening. Sometimes, in, in the ca case of, of the, the, the case you refer to, it, it's been a very, very long and difficult discussion. Um, and then even if the Euthanasia Commission decides that the request will be granted, he might not be able to find a doctor who is willing to do it because that's the second step. And of course, that every doctor, every, in every case, has to decide every time again, in this case, can I do it? Do I want to do it? Do I feel up to it? Or do I don't feel up to it? And it's quite possible that this guy, he might not find a physician able to help him. Okay, I want to see what you think. I'm very alarmed by the points actually that Kevin just raised about opening doors and slippery slopes when you made the point, Kevin, that one of the things that you're concerned about with this is that once you open the door a little bit, then, you know, other people could be dealt with as well with any, com with any claim of autonomy or compassion because it seems to me that um, when the way that we understand autonomy when we talk about personal autonomy in decision making, is it something that you either grant or you don't grant, and it's not something that you grant only when you believe it's right. So if we believe that people have the moral autonomy to make personal decisions about moral issues that are contested socially for themselves, and to take those actions for themselves when they don't impact directly on other people. If it's to be an issue of moral autonomy, you have to either say people can do that or people can't do that. You can't say they can do it, but only when I think it's right. Similarly, doctors acting out of compassion. I, you know, I, would want, I, I, I think that we would hope that doctors in general would always be looking to act out of compassion and that there wouldn't be a limit to doctors' compassion because a law stood in their particular way. Um, so, the, so the idea of the law being a closure on either autonomy or compassion, I find a difficult thing to unpick. The thing that I find particularly difficult about, about this is the way that we've all become incredibly exercised about the notion of the Belgian law in relation to children. You know, and the way that this session is badged is clearly Belgians' right to die for children, a slippery slope, or we talk about euthanasia for children. And what I would like to know is a little bit more about the circumstances in which we're looking at this in Belgium, because it seems to me that the circumstances that are being described are those where we have a child who is terminally ill, who is suffering, who is having a discussion with their doctors and, their, and, their, and presumably their parents and their family about what they want their future to be and how effectively that death is going to be managed. And rather than doctors shying away from moral responsibility, it seems to me that the doctors in those circumstances are taking a huge amount of moral responsibility because what they are actually doing is managing an end-of-life situation, whatever we call it, that is going to happen. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in why we think that this is something that is a huge moral outrage that everybody wants to take a particular stand on in the abstract, when it seems to me that this is really an issue that's, that's about the management of a very specific an ultimately incredibly tragic, sad situation for young people, for families, and their doctors. And I don't think that it is a, a kind of a, a coarsening of society in saying that if you allow decisions to be taken for people to be treated in this way, it necessarily means that we're celebrating the end of life or in any way devaluing it. Rather, I think that what we're saying is we're looking at the role that doctors play. I found it quite interesting that the panel hasn't actually spoken about animal euthanasia. I mean, I think it's very interesting to say it's an open door, but it's actually been an open door for a very, very long time in the animal field. Now, 
I, I find it quite worrying and quite disturbing from a professional point of view that it would be that it would be even remotely implied to be a moral abdication. Because I think in the veterinary field, it certainly isn't. And I think I have seen in practice as a student uh, vets refuse to euthanize animals and uh, vets to have a very productive conversation about an animal's welfare. And I think it always comes down to consent and at what point you sort of need to make a consent yourself as a professional. I think the issue here is consent. I think as far as a child is, I think it would be interesting for the panel to talk about both the similarities and the differences between child euthanasia and animal euthanasia. I think there are a lot of productive comments to be made. I agree with everything that my uh, neighbour here was uh, saying with regards to um, the importance of uh, a conversation between doctors and patients. And that's, no, I don't think that's any less valid uh, when we're dealing with sort of, um, young children. Um, however, I think, that it's, I think that it's important we do actually sort of look at the, um, you know, take on the assumption, I suppose, um, uh, of the notion that euthanasia will, will necessarily offer a good, painless death. We seem to have this sort of phrase that you know, euthanasia equals death with dignity. Um, and yet we've seen from certain cases in the States, for example, um, I know Kevin gave the example of um, capital punishment, um, where we've seen um, inmates who've been killed and it's taken a long time, it's obviously, it's, it's been very painful and very distressing. Um, it also reminded me of a paper uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine, I don't remember the um, author, I think it was Linda Genzini, um, that highlighted, the, um, made, the, uh, made the comparison between physician assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia. Um, where it established that one in ten patients uh, receiving physician-assisted suicide um, experience side effects of uh, vomiting, internal bleeding, uh, slipping in and out of consciousness, loss of bowel control, um, and for the medicine not necessarily to even work. Um, so as a result, the, the patient in many circumstances could end up in an even worse and more painful distressing conditions than before. For voluntary euthanasia, that was 5%. Okay. Um, so, um, so I suppose my question is, if this is what we're going to be offering children, is this the kind of conversation which we're happy, with, um, happy to have with children? Um, and are these the kind of side effects that, um, that a child is necessarily going to have the capacity to accept and understand? The, the law as it stands now actually works in the sense that what happens really is a dialogue takes place between the family, the, the doctor, the um, the, the patient where possible, where not possible with the family. And what I want to say about that is actually, um, in my experience, it is a time really for quite ordinary people who are not experts or not philosophers or not doctors to engage in actually really profound and important um, discussions that are meaningful and that make life and death meaningful. My fear is that in introducing a law, a kind of legislative, or you know, worse than a committee making a decision on this, seems to me the law is such a blunt instrument that it undermines the, the, the relationship, the deep and meaningful relationships between human beings. So my question is, is the law that you're talking about that needs to be introduced, who's it there to protect? Is it to protect the doctors? or is it to support the families and the, and the dying? I think that question's very interesting. What is the law for? Aren't things working as well as they can at the moment? And I'm interested in this um, contradiction, really, or this problem of autonomy um, from you. So who wants to go first? Inora? Um, I'll have a go on that very well put question about who is the law there to protect. I actually believe that were the Faulkner Bill to be sufficiently tidied up to pass, uh, the net result would not change things enormously. Remember that it doesn't address people who can't have conversations. Remember that many, many distressing deaths are about people who are the deaths of people who have lost cognitive capacity. Uh, it would, the conversations would still be crucial. Uh, it is really a question of not the patient, but uh, the physician having an, uh, supposedly an advance guarantee that the line of action taken was 
permissible, whereas now it remains an open question until after someone's death where, if it is the case that someone has acted to hasten that death, then there will be a decision whether or not to prosecute. It is rarely deemed in the public interest. One that was recently was somebody who tried to kill her son who was in a coma. He had not chosen to die. The doctors thought he might recover. She was prevented. Unfortunately, she returned and did successfully. And that's the only sort of case that prosecution is used for. Kevin? Um, on autonomy, I think it, the, the implication of autonomy, if everybody has autonomy, we all have to have an equal autonomy. And we have that in the sense that, for instance, everybody in this room has the ability to, to kill themselves. That's an option that's open for people at all times, and it should be. I think that's a good thing. I don't think it should be illegal or anything else like that. Uh, the problem, I think, comes when you segment off a group of people, which is what the Faulkner Bill is proposing to do, and to say that you, with six months to live, your lives aren't worth living, will permit suicide for you. The rest of you were not going to permit suicide for you. And um, I think the, the question at the, at the front is absolutely right. If you grant one thing to one group, how can you deny it to other people? And you've seen, for instance, Paul Lamb is campaigning, even though he would not, uh, uh, you know, uh, fit in with the, the Faulkner Bill's criteria. And you've seen other people. I, 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 but I think so that's why not if they're consenting, if they're able to consent? Because they have the option of suicide already to them. This is the thing. I, you know, people have that option. Why is there this great need for assistance is, uh, I suppose, my question. Um, there are very, very few people that, that, that require assistance at all. And anybody uh, with an, a bit of will and, and determination and preparation can kill themselves. Uh, and I think that is an option that exists in reality right now, which is what makes the right to die such a silly phrase. Do you think? Yes, I would, I would really like to answer to that. I think when you commit, have to commit suicide in order to die, you die very lonely with a lot of fear and maybe you don't even succeed. So I would say I, I, there, is no, there is no ideal death. Nowhere, I, I'm sure about that. Uh, but I know that uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia, preferably, in, in any case, this allows the patient to be um, within the, the family or the setting of, of, of his loved ones. And I mean, for me, I don't care how long I will live that much, but when I die, I want to be encountered by everybody I love and not alone hanging on a rooftop. No, not, not at all. Do you want to say one more thing and then I'll go back out? One yeah, thing? Uh, one thing. Uh, I say that the law, Faulkner law, in the United Kingdom is going to solve one problem, which is called death tourism. Right now we had more than 300 Britons who went to Switzerland to find solace there. I think this is embarrassing. Uh, the saying, my home is my castle, is true in Britain. I'm the first person to testify this. And people should not drive all the way or fly all the way to Switzerland to find the solace. They rather die at home with their friends and loved ones at home in the castle. Okay. Thanks. I think for such a difficult topic, um, the definitions have to be quite clear and meaningful. And I think that the way autonomy is being discussed, um, Kevin, you use the term, but it feels like what it's a meaningless term if you say everyone has equal autonomy without specifying what that means. If someone has locked-in syndrome, that person doesn't have the ability to commit suicide at that time with the same autonomy and control and options open to them as somebody who is fully mobile, etc. So to sort of have an a abstract notion, we all have equal autonomy, is meaningless. It has to be about what are the actual options available to the person in the situation and I think there's also a really important distinction that has to be made between a right to die or deciding when to die as opposed to deciding to die. And a child who has a terminal illness is not in the same category as children making a decision to enter the army or making a decision to get married or whatever. There's already a time clock on that child's life. And the question is how and when the child dies, not if. Uh, Professor Barge. 
Does it require the consent of the parents when yes. this happens? Yes. Because no normally children had no rights legally. In adoption and fostering, it was the parents' decision. But when we had two children there, the last one only about 20 years ago, it was the first time we didn't treat them like chattels, that they had no rights in terms of adoption or fostering. But well, we then created these um, ad litem so that you get, you'll have a, if it's a split family and the wife and the husband competing for the child, yes, of course. the child has a third yeah. person looking after. Locked in syndrome, very sad, but there are lots of sad things happen. Most of us do not get to choose when we die and how nice it will be. It's, I don't really understand when we lost our compass here as to understand exactly why we're, we're now choosing uh, a, a good death. By your logic, if I can just quickly say, by your logic, because I don't know whether I will be knocked over by a bus without my family around me singing, playing a harp and, and you know, not sharing videos no, of, of the, the bus, <laughs> then I should choose best to die now. Why bother okay. living? Professor van der Werft and Bosch, you've couched it in terms of children's right to request death. And Professor O'Neill, I know that you've kind of famously said that children have their, that a child's ultimate remedy is to grow up. But you said that in 1992, so you may... In a quite different context. <laughs> okay, in a very different context. But I was wondering what you think specifically about um, this in terms of children's rights, uh, if this is a discussion about children's rights. Interesting. The issue of assisted suicide and indeed euthanasia is quite well understood by the leading proponents of both sides. They understand each other's case very well. And a lot of it comes down to bedrock intuitions about what is absolutely impermissible. So some people just think that you've crossed a Rubicon. Killing deliberately somebody who's innocent, even at their own request, is just absolutely impermissible. And so arguments about slippery slopes and so on, they may be sound, but they're a sort of addition to the, the main point. Um, on those other arguments, though, about slippery slopes and so on, I mean, um, my own views are very undecided. I think there are very powerful arguments on both sides of this. But one, argue, one problem I do have with something Kevin Ewell said about anybody being able to commit suicide and so on, it's unfortunately just not true, as somebody just said a moment ago from the floor. If you have locked-in syndrome, if you have some advanced motor neuron disease, you really are not physically able to kill yourself. Now, you might say, oh, you can always starve yourself to death. That's not a nice way to go. The other point I'd make is, even if it were the case you could commit suicide, um, does it follow from that you should not be allowed assisted suicide? It's a bit like saying, um, you can't have pears because after all, you can always eat apples. You know, there's always something else you can have. How does it follow that assisted suicide is wrong just because there is an alternative? It's not clear. Thank you. The only way you can stop an idea moving down a slope is by keeping it off the slope. You can put as much grit as you like on the slope, but the grit will only slow the movement. It won't stop it. Now, what does that mean in this context? It means simply that in order to keep an idea off this slope, you need to have a hard and fast, firm principle, a moral principle, one that is easy to state, easy to understand, everyone knows where the line is. And that is what we have with the, assisted, uh, with the, with the Suicide Act, which says, and this is why it is so important, it says that the state will not sanction assisted suicide. That is a fundamental principle, and it is of supreme importance. You cannot weaken that principle, you can only destroy it. And this is not a question of framing legislation in a very clever way. You can't frame legislation. You see that with Lord Faulkner's bill. Whenever you see the word six months, you know that there's no principle involved. Why six months? Why not 12? Why not forget about time limits altogether? People have already said, if people who are terminally ill can commit assisted suicide, why not also those with locked-in syndrome? This is legislation which will destroy a very important principle ratified by the state. Now, I do have some sympathy with the problems which from time to time develop. They do exceptionally arise. The current state of affairs can cope with that adequately. It happens under the legal radar. It is not sanctioned by the state, but there is prosecutorial discretion. That discretion is exercised in a sensible way so that people who do act humanely avoid sanctions of the criminal law. Um, Dr. Kevin, you mentioned that uh, we all have the ability to uh, kill um, ourselves and therefore you don't uh, see the uh, point of euthanasia. I'd like to point out that uh, all uh, women who are pregnant are also able to destroy the fetus themselves as well. But does that mean that we should outlaw abortion? 
um, a lot of proponents uh, of uh, abortions have stated that uh, outlawing abortion um, only stops safe abortions, and I'd like to say that um, similarly outlawing uh, or not allowing euthanasia only stops. Uh, no, you made your point very clear. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, no, I, agree. I actually agree with the gentleman over there. Six months is, is random and ludicrous from a prognostic perspective and under the law that's being proposed. But ultimately, we're talking here not about a negative right to die. We're talking about a positive right to be killed. If we're going to allow a positive right to be killed on the basis of a, a few people who, who, are, who can't kill themselves, who are not covered by the current bill going through the Lords, incidentally. What is the effect that that giving of autonomy to a small minority has on the autonomy of many other people? In Oregon, which is the model for the law in this country, in 1998, when the Death of Dignity Act came out, 13% of people who were opting to go for assisted suicide gave the fact that they felt a burden on their families as one of the reasons. In 2012, that was 57.1%. That is the slippery slope. I don't know what is. Leave us with your final, most important thought, Nora, to begin. Okay. I agree that the debate is not well conducted in terms of two caricature figures, the wholly autonomous patient and the wholly compassionate physician or relative. That isn't in the bill, but I accept entirely that there are many things in the bill that are not tied down at all adequately at present. I regard one of them as being this idea that a six-month horizon uh, is a definite moment. Uh, it is not. And I think the question of that, uh, what's a terminal illness, the question of what is uh, a, an adequately competent patient, the question of uh, what is a settled intention and has it been evidenced in advanced directives are all entirely open at this stage. So get your letters in fast. Raphael. The issue of the six months uh, is an issue that has been raised by physicians. It's not raised by, the, by Faulkner and others. I was one of the drafters of the Israeli law, the dying patient law, and when we consider the same things and we always also use the same terminology. Uh, the six month appeared not in our committee, but appeared in the committee of the physicians. They suggested this because that's the frame of mind that they are operating to describe what, what they call terminal illness. So something that is beyond terminal illness, if you live more, if the, the prognosis is more than six months, you're not terminal. So that's how it came about. But actually it doesn't mean necessarily that they are going to fall and count the months. It's just a, a figure of, of, of framing a time limit. Um, with regard to Belgium, there are two things I would like to say that are important. Uh, one is that every one of us has to, to ask the question whether mental health and maturity are still important for us, whether there is such a thing that is called adulthood or not. And if we think that there is such a thing that is called adulthood, then I think that you know, this kind of question should be set apart from, from children. And there was a lot of discussion here from the audience about autonomy. The strange thing for me as a researcher who comes to, the, to Belgium and speaks with the physicians who do uh, euthanasia is that although the, the official language is one of autonomy and the autonomy of the patient, the, the patients now need to decide and so on, but when you speak with the physician, very senior physicians, the term consent of the patient doesn't appear there, which I find staggering. Only last month, or I think it was June or July, uh, the president of the uh, intensive care units in Belgium issued guidelines uh, for how to uh, decide uh, end-of-life issues. And one thing that is missing from throughout the document is the patient consent. Well, I would like to remark to the lady who asked the second question, I think, is the law designed for the, for the patient or for the physician? And I think, as a physician, that I'm very happy with a law that gives me lots of possibilities to help my patients as much as possible within their wishes at their, at their end of life stage. Um, I suppose, um, therefore, the law is designed for, for the physician. But I hope that about 70% of the patients, because that's the amount of patients that gets to choose how they die, because only 30% will die abruptly, um, will benefit from it most, more than the physicians after all. Kevin. I think the the point made at the back is absolutely right. I think there is a fundamental moral principle uh, that the state may not sanction killing, and that this is what is actually behind uh, my argument, certainly, that uh, you should not have the state sanction it. And I think uh, what we're often 
in the whole debate, we seem to be losing sight of the principle of the competent adult deciding for themselves, of, of the sort of freedom of a competent adult to do so. So therefore, when we're looking at children, you're not really giving rights to children. What you're doing is reducing the concept of, of a competent adult um, to the level of a child. It's, it's not really giving the children that much rights, usually de facto, it's, it's adults making decisions for children. I have two children, so I know this. Uh, you have to make decisions for children. You might say, yes, oh, what do you want to do? And I think that's a very good thing to do. But in the end, you have to make the decision and you have to take responsibility for that decision. And that's what seems to be being lost sight of in the whole discussion, not only in this country, but in the other. There are many, many questions I'd love to come back on, but uh, we can talk about it later. The only thing I, I would say um, is, the whole issue is of, of I, I think euthanasia is permissible uh, as, again, the speaker at the back said, under the radar. And I think anybody should take an act of compassion when it is clearly an act of compassion and when you are absolutely certain. And you should take full responsibility for that action and not try and hide behind a law. This is why I was talking about taking moral responsibility for, for your actions. And uh, yes, uh, you know, it's a very important principle, and that's the one underlying what I'm actually talking about in this discussion. It was very interesting, um, particularly for such an emotional and quite a difficult discussion. So please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.